So I want to, I'll introduce Louis. Louis Chudasoki is a writer and scholar whose books include The Last Darkie, Burt Williams, Black and Black Ministry, and the Africa, African Diaspora, um, The Sound of Culture, Diaspora and Black Technopoetics, and the acclaimed memoir that we're here today to discuss, Floating in a Most Peculiar Way. He's the editor-in-chief of The Black Scholar, one of the oldest and leading journals of Black studies in the United States, and he's a professor at BU. Um, welcome, Lewis. I fell in love with your book. I was introduced to it through the work of Bill T. Jones, but there's so much beautiful writing on the sentence level and on the scene setting level. Um, but I also was struck, you know, I think what the book has to teach my students is that a, a memoir can be, in addition to it being a container of memories, it can really be a way of showing how people in your family and communities talked about nationalities and racial identities and history with each other. So memoir as a reckoning, it felt like there was an, an urgency and an electricity in on every page. So um and then there was this wonderful way that was very continuously surprising of how you um braided in david bowie um your obsession with him as a kid and even structuring the the chapters with song titles so um i guess what i wanted to ask first and then i'll let my students ask questions is can you talk about the challenge and opportunity of representing so many different people's ideology in memoir? Um, first off, thank you for the kind words about the book. I really appreciate uh, those words. And for you to have begun by sort of describing the other books that I've done, it's important to point out that those scholarly and academic books were, believe it or not, on my mind as I tried to tell a very personal and intimate story that resonates with broader political, academic, and intellectual concerns, but to not write it like a college professor trying to reach a larger audience, <laughs> but to write it, in fact, as a person who started out, as you might see in the novel, wanting to write fiction and wanting to eventually write memoir as a way of writing realistic fiction, as I called it when I was much younger, fiction, fiction about things that really happened. Um, but really trying to convey the broader ideological concerns of the various people in my family, but without trying to police them, without trying to make sure they all said the right thing that readers are going to agree on, right? So that's a big part of the challenge, but the, the, what liberated me was really just creating it like a dining table. And there's a whole scene there where they're at the dining table, right? And creating it like a set of arguments, which believe it or not, is how I teach as a scholar. Students may come to my classes expecting, here is what black people think, but what they get in my classes is, here is how black people argue with each other. <laughs> here is how Du Bois argued with Booker T. Washington. And here's how Toni Morrison argued with Alice Walker. And that set of arguments, as I've been doing as a scholar, I think served me well when I decided, well, let me just frame my family as a set of arguments and debates where we still love each other, but we don't always get along with each other. And that is universal. And I think everybody in this room probably <laughs> relates to that on some level. And so I think the intimacy doesn't necessarily come from people getting along, but people staying in each other's lives, even though they don't get along. And for me, that allows me to sort of convey the ideological as well as the personal. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll open it up to the group, but it, it's, you know, I, I thought of it like that dinner table portion of the book about two thirds of the way in, you know, which is extraordinary. I, I think of it as like almost like ensemble work, you know, it's almost like the work that a playwright would take on um, who had, you know, who had a pretty large cast. Um, it isn't, it's, it can be unwieldy to have so many characters talking yeah. and thinking on, on a, page. So um, yeah. Okay. So who else has a question? Yeah. Emily and then Caroline. Hi, Lewis. Hi, Emily. 
Okay. Um, the first thing I noticed when I was reading your book was um, what I considered an extraordinary level of compression and a natural feeling to the narrative. And that, then I started to notice how complicated, <laughs> how many different elements you were weaving together with with ease in the way the narrative was written. And because there's there are sociological elements, there are cultural elements, there's pop culture, there's there's so many different things here. And I I thought, did you know all of especially the historical parts and um the things you bring in, did you know all this at the beginning from your scholarly work or did you have to do research? And what was the most difficult about all this? So thank you for that. This story comes out of a couple of things, attempt, um, certainly in the scholarly stuff. But the scholarly stuff as a professional scholar is related to but different from the research you have to do into your own family. And because my own family is so connected to a lot of different things like the Biafra War and the historical migrations of different kinds of Black folk, that's something you research in addition to your scholarly work as a professor. But, but you know, Emily, this is also a story about someone who hears, who's heard people talking about this stuff his whole life. And I would argue that the reason I became a scholar is because my uncles kept talking about Biafra or colonization, or I'd look on the bookshelves and there were books by Franz Fanon and different people like that. And so by the time I got to college, there was a real crossover between what my uncles and aunts were arguing about or saying at the, you know, after church and what I was reading in certain classes when I got to college, for example, and walked into a class on Nigerian lit, the first one that UCLA had ever taught. And I'm reading these books and I'm like, hearing the lectures and I'm like, I think that's my uncle, <laughs> right? Or if it's not my uncle, these things that the scholars are trying to figure out are the same things people argued about. So a lot of that, I was blessed to have all of that and cursed because it's a real pain. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what really happens for me is it's not so much, the, the research and the material was there, but that doesn't make it easy to compress, to use the word you used, right. into right. a narrative. And so the real struggle as a writer is to compress it without leaving out too much. And the original version of this thing, I thought it was going to be a trilogy. And I thought it, it was also much, much bigger. And so being able to compress, meaning take important things out, was very painful, but necessary, right? And I think that, to answer your final question, that was the most challenging part, to take so many things out that, to be honest with you, would have been fine in there. But it would have, it would have made the book just a little bit more ponderous, right? And so I really wanted the book to have a lot of this detail, but not all of it. The scholar wants it all in. The human being knows that we never have it all. <laughs> and, we, and we operate with these fragments that we all try to assemble. And so that's what I decided to do, which is why it was shockingly so much smaller than I thought, but also because when it was smaller, it emotionally worked better. That That's such a wonderful answer. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, I had a whole, it had so much velocity that, you know, it wouldn't have had, it would have been weighed down. I think I had, you know, I think part of how it, it achieves its speed and flight is, is attributed to the fact that you trim so, so much. Caroline, what was your question? And I'm still, uh, I still feel, I still feel the pain of the things I had to cut. Trust me. <laughs> you write another book. Well, that's, that's another conversation, but yes. <laughs> Um, Professor Soki, my name is Caroline. I am just blown away by your book. Oh, and thank you. It is so beautiful. I've never read a book whose title matched the story so well because you really do float through. You kind of float above your life in such a beautiful way. I appreciate the definition that you offered us, the etymology of the word nostalgia, mm. which I just want to tell you because you said it comes from the Greek, uh, nostos homecoming, algos pain, 
And I wrote that, that is gonna inform my writing because it's painful to look back with nostalgia. And it was seen as a disease. And you have to work through the pain. <laughs> of it. But one of the points of identification for me was the way that books informed your life mm -hmm. as a child in Jamaica, how you had to steal the books and hide them, and then how you shared them beautifully with the children in your home. And I just wanted to know how books informed your sense of self, um, your, uh, inspired your, your becoming a writer, what that connection was for you in your life. Thank you. Um, looking back, I would say that books provided validation and verification. When you're in a space where you're without your parents, without roots, without knowing where you're going to end up, all of that socio-political, cultural stuff, on top of just being a kid, for God's sakes, right? Not knowing anything, right? And not the, not a teenager yet. A teenager is when you suddenly think you know it all and you don't know it, but you think you do. This is before that. This is before the arrogance of teenage sets in. And books, I think, at that point, always offered me validity and verification. Now, politically later on, you, you discover, oh, these books were colonialist or they were racist or they had these negative representations. But as a kid, you're like, maybe, sure, yes. But at the same time, in the world that you're in, they offer you a kind of grounding in the possible, right? They give you a world that you can shape and that you can be a part of, whereas the world around you, you're not a part of, right? And to be honest with you, that's where Bowie comes in, because Bowie was one of those early figures that, for Bowie, it's not just being an alien. As an alien, Bowie's argued something that I'd never heard before, that you're an outsider and an alien, and you're cooler than the people who are inside. <laughs> right? You're an alien outsider, but you don't want to be an insider. You want to be different, and you like that. So books offered that, and Bowie was like one of the first musical figures that seemed to offer that as well. You know, you're, you're marginalized, but you do so with style, right? And so, and also when I listen to a lot of Bowie, there are other people I could have mentioned, other singers and musicians, but you know, one of the great things about Bowie as a kid, especially when I came to America, if you listen to Bowie, he refers to books all the time. And so here's a pop star who gave you a reading list for God's sake, right? I went nuts, I loved it. I absolutely <laughs> loved it because it fit in with what it was like as a child growing up in Jamaica, stealing these books. But I never felt that I was stealing them because I mean, they're there, they're books, they're to be read. And the family that I was in, as I think I mentioned in the book, books were for display to show your class and your sophistication. You know, I think as a kid, I felt I'm the one that they're for because I'm the one actually reading them, right? And they really verify and validate my presence in the world, regardless of what the characters may have looked like. Who else has a question? Monique? And then Tracy. Hi, so nice to meet you. Thank you Hi, so Monique. much for being here with us. Um, uh, the, the first thing I wanted to say that what you're talking about with the cutting, it does make me think of Murder Your Darlings. And um, I, I do think that the, that the, that the velocity lent uh, a levity to a tough story that is just a, a lightness that really gives the reader so much because it kind of allows us to take the story in from this kind of light and lovely place that that's just so masterful um I wondered if you I wondered if you had to get the rights for the Bowie songs but the song titles um and then the only other thing that uh that 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 you just said that really that really spoke to me personally was you know how it's just about staying in each other's lives even though we don't get along because that's very much my situation with my family, the work that I'm working on, that we we low key really struggle, and yet we are around each other all the time, and it's just it, that's where the tension is, I suppose. Um, so yeah, those were so really the rights, I guess, question foremost, and then just navigating the familial. Thank you. Well, without sounding too cheesy, 
that last bit about not getting along but being around each other, it sounds so simplistic, but it's kind of what we need more of an understanding of. <laughs> I mean, and this connects to your question about the light and levity. You know, I wanted to write a book about genocide, which it starts with racism, the difficulties of immigration and racial identity, but that was that everybody would engage. Um, a sense of humor, a wry sense of humor, an absurd experience of all these issues. That's part of the light and levity that you mentioned. And you're right, this cutting out so much of that stuff enabled it to sort of move faster and hit harder. But the light and levity was something that came to me as a surprise because I wasn't actually trying to write a book with this strange sense of humor until I realized that, well, it actually is my sense of humor and it was always there for me as a kid. And it's just, I wanna be honest about, this is how I deal with the traumas and difficulties of my family and personal experience. And it's not a comedy certainly, but it's a light and levity that suggests that these are experiences that I want to share and be shared, right? And I want to invite people into it. So what I'm hearing from you is that you felt invited into it. And I'm grateful for that because I did do that on purpose. Um, but it did come as a surprise. You know, it, I didn't start out writing this book knowing that the memoir was going to take this particular shape, right? In fact, I argued with agents, uh, not agents, with my editors back and forth for a long time because I didn't even want to write a continuous narrative. I wanted to just write like little essays that were slightly disconnected from each other until I realized that that was a way of evo avoiding, <laughs> right? What it means to stay with one dark, complicated story, right? And the answer to dealing with a dark, complicated story was in fact to not mock or laugh at these things, but to, 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 make, it, to make it lighter, right? And the word light, I don't even think is right. It's just, I don't know what the right word is at this point because I, I wanted something, I didn't want to lose the, the heaviness of the material, but I wanted it to be accessible to people to not be turned off by it because being turned off by each other's traumas is not a good strategy for, <laughs> for our success as a, as, a, as a people, right? But the Bowie thing is really funny I found out that according to the publishers and communicating with the Bowie people, what they were asking for us to pay for, for some of the longer titles and longer uh, quotes, there's no way we could afford it. There's no way we could afford it. But apparently for a book like this, titles and one line, right? You didn't have to pay anything. So there were, uh, there were earlier drafts that had like much more Bowie text, much more Bowie lyrics, right? Like in the Young American section is when we had some difficulties because had a lot of Bowie lyrics woven into the, into the narrative, but that cost way too much money. And so I ended up just sort of uh, riffing on the theme and the vibe and the feel and the contrast between Bowie and our time and that caused me to go back throughout the narrative and to just be more suggestive rather than, you know, um, deliberate in terms of using more and more text that I would critique or interpret or weave in. And I ended up thinking that it's a great thing I didn't have enough money because it was just, I think it's much better to be evocative rather than using the lyrics deliberately. And I think, I think the Bowie thing also helps with you know, the seriousness, but also the lightness. Um, do you have time for one more question from Tracy? Oh, oh absolutely. Gosh, hi, I'm Tracy. Thank hi, you. Tracy. So much. Thank you so much for the time you're giving us this afternoon. Um, a couple of times Lizzie has talked about the um, in writing a memoir, the, the two timelines, the the person from the outside and for you, the child, the child. And I'm curious about um, that experience for you. Was it, um, you know, what kind of choreography did you 
as you straddled back and forth, you you, may, you alluded a little bit to saying you realized, as I, I assume, as the writer, that this humor was actually you as that's that's you as a child so maybe there was was a little less straddling that i than i imagine but 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 looking at your experience through a, a, a an adult's eyes an academic's eyes and and bringing to the page the child's life i'm i'm just curious in the next two minutes <laughs> what you can say about that well, you know, the the mundane and not very sexy answer is drafting, 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 <laughs> right? And I'm sure Lizzie talks about the importance of drafting. We know that uh, most writing is really editing until you get the right voice and the right balance, right? But, but Tracy, it's also the case that once I realized that, you know, an earlier draft is the child's voice. A, a, another early draft is the author's voice, right? And neither of them really worked, but the author's voice through the child's eyes, that's what generated the humor and the absurdity because you're reading the voice of a mature person, but it's the perspective of a kid, right? And so once I hit that particular balance, it created the absurdity, it conveyed the depth the seriousness of the material, but as a kid finding out that, oh, you are a product of genocide and there is racism around you. You know, I think it's important to point out that kids aren't suddenly going, yes, we must resist oppression. You know, they're kids, <laughs> right? And the, the adult voice gets it, but the kid doesn't. And that particular contrast right there, once I nailed that or felt like I nailed it in the drafting process, I just stuck with it. That's great. Thank you. Um, our time is up. That went very quickly. Um, thank you so much for the insights that you just shared and um, and all the insights I got from reading the book. It just had such a wonderful on on it, it the book operates on so many different levels for me. And so um, I just feel a, a tremendous amount of gratitude towards you for writing it and for visiting with us. Um, I know you've got a lot um, on your plate as an academic, but I do hope you'll write more memoir um, and personal essay because I it's extraordinary what you're able to do on the, on the page. Thank you, I really appreciate this. I think I mentioned to you that this is the first time I've talked about the, the memoir in a while. I've been on a no talk about the memoir thing <laughs> for the last year, because after it came out, there was a lot of talk about the memoir. So this has been really, really wonderful to sort of get back into the conversation. Um, I am gonna, I've got other books in, ahead, but I do have a follow-up to this one planned. Oh, um, great. And I look forward to that. And for those of you, <laughs> I don't wanna pitch anything, but I have an essay. The first thing I wrote after the memoir came out was a book, I'm sorry, was an essay about reflecting on my reading as a kid in Jamaica. And although it has a deliberately um, an, um, obnoxious title, I would recommend, if you're interested to read it, it's called In Praise of Racist Books. And the subtitle is Notes of an Immigrant Reader. And it's just about growing up in Jamaica and not being wealthy, you know, not being wealthy enough to choose what books you read. And so you ended up loving books that you later on found out were racist or colonialist. But what that does for your imagination is ultimately, I think, a good thing. And so the essay is not an academic one, but it was the first thing I wrote after the memoir. And it was about reflecting on the question that you asked, um, I think it was you, Tracy, about books in my childhood. So it's, so it's, it's available online. 